Well, a very warm good afternoon from uh, the Center for Print Research in uh, Bristol, from French AW Block at UE Bristol. Uh, very welcome, welcome from me, Frank Menger, to our last uh, lunchtime seminar uh, of 2021. Uh, and welcome to, we welcome today Laura Bescaoli, uh, who's an animator who's had a history, if I can say so, uh, of uh, being connected to UE as well. And she is just about to write up her final bits of the P of her PhD, which is hoping, fingers crossed, to hand in in March. And she is here now to tell us uh, about her last project, the crafty, crafty the crafty witch. So, without further ado, Laura Best, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Frank. Cool. So. Oh. Hello everyone, uh, thank you for joining us here today. My name is Laura Beth Cowley and I'm a final year PhD researcher here at the CFPR. And for the last four years, I've been conducting research into the use of 3D printing in the stop motion animation process and industry. So today I'm gonna to be talking to you about my final case study, which was a film that looked at the potential for aesthetic and tactile quality of 3D printing to create unique style profiles for stop motion animation. So my research in general has been a, a, an empirical action research investigation focused on both practice and theory, involving case studies and interviews with leading industry professionals to look at both the advent of 3D printing within animation, 3D printing as a tool in itself. Sorry, and a sorry, way Laura Beth. I'm oh. not sure if we're supposed to be seeing your screen. Oh, sorry. Yes, of course. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so, yeah, sorry, I'll start that again. So my research in general has been a kind of empirical action research, investigating focused on both practice and theory, involving case studies and interviews with leading industry professionals to look at both the advent of 3D printing within the animation industry, uh, 3D printing as a tool in itself and a way of making tools, as well as the impact it has had on the craft, authorship, and the aesthetic of stop motion production. Uh, so my thesis and my study is broken down into, into those three distinct sections as shown here by the overlapping sections on the, this Venn diagram into craft, authorship, and aesthetic. And this case study uh, presents the final, and to be honest, most widely considered, considered element of my study, um, the aesthetic potential. Um, as animation films making as a medium is largely concerned with the assertion of meaning into story, but the animation of course has this ability to do this with like an innumerable number of materials and techniques, all of which have their own aesthetic and textual meaning or means for expression. So this film itself is, is very short, it's only a minute long, and was inspired by early woodcut prints from uh, that accompanied pamphlets on the testing for witchcraft during the witch trials in England. Um, and this was a reflection on the idea of craft or the word crafty as it has connotations with links to cunning folk and witchcraft in general, which to me felt like a nice way to round out the study as a whole. Um, I also noticed in these early woodcuts that through their kind of simplified, almost naive interpretations of faces, there was an almost modernist or cubist style to, to them that for me were re instantly reminiscent of classic animator style known broadly as cartoon modern. That was a prominent animation style most notable in the work of the, Amer of the American animation studio known as United Productions of America or UPA. Uh, that was formed from 1940s to the 1970s um, and were largely formed of ex-Disney staff who rejected the Disney rhetoric towards um, hyper-realism or the illusion of realism and focused instead on modernist art and the idea of using the animation med medium to its fullest, which is in itself is an ethos that fits well into my own considerations for the case study into an alternative vision for 3D printing animation that looks more towards a kind of post-digital glitch or sloppy craft use as a way of reflecting on the remediation, remediated nature of 3D printing. 
The woodcuts also provided a reference for the material nature of 3D printing of the kind of layer lines, which I wanted to highlight in order to re replicate the, si the sense of pattern and shape in the prints and replicate as a uh, texture in the prints themselves. So in order to make the film, I collaborated with a local Bristol animator known as Sam Shaw, who studied at UE for a BA in animation in 2013, but is now a lead designer and director at Sun and Moon Studio Studios here in Bristol. Um, and he's really well known for his reoccurring use of this kind of classic UPA style in both his personal and commercial work, some of which you're seeing now. So it was a natural fit for character design and pre-visualization for this film. So after discussing the project with Sam, he produced an animatic. Um, if you don't know what an animatic is, an animatic is an in-depth moving storyboard, which is a common pre-production tool in the animation industry. And for me, it formed the base for the study. Which we can see now. So once I had this, I also pitched the film for an industry filmmaker uh, panel at the Ukraine Film Festival uh, Lenonium, which I presented the film and the concepts to two industry in experts, Tim Allen here on the left, who is a phenomenal British animator who has worked on many of the biggest stop motion projects in the last two decades, including Corpse Bride, Fantastic Fox and Isle of Dogs. And um, Arida Zong, an animator and director based in Athens, Greece, who works, spans short films and commercials with expertise in mixed media animation production. So this allowed me for, to develop an industry-led feedback loop that offered advice and suggestions and who, were, who would offer feedback at the end of the project as well. So then began the long process of testing layer heights. This was done by adapting an FDM printer with help from uh, Sony Lightfoot. Um, of the CFPR, and we used the Hero Me Gen 5 upgrade, which used the which was used to adapt the printer to allow for a stronger, more heat resistant hot end to allow for more filament to be pushed through at the correct temperature when using a larger nozzle. So I then went on to create iterative cycles of changing printing and design parameters to find the sweet spot between getting the thickest possible layer heights without the print uh, falling apart due to layer layers not adhering to one another. So whilst doing this as prints would take between 15 minutes to an hour to print, I began breaking down the animatic to figure out what replacement parts I would need. As you can see in the spreadsheet, I, also, I first broke down the animatic into frames, then assessed how many repeated parts there were. And then I began sculpting each part Unlike most people using 3D printing for animation who would use a combination of um, CAD, 3D and surface modeling softwares for various parts of the puppet, I created every element of this film in Fusion 360, which is a CAD software. Um, and this was partially to keep the geometry as simple and clean as possible um, because of the use of these high layer heights, as well as using the potential restrictions of CAD to develop this relief carved visual style to the parts to further incorporate the relief print process into the puppet design. Although the bodies and heads were printed on a, an FDM machine, all additional elements like the hat, the eyes, the mouth, the hands and feet were printed on a, an SLA printer to make use of the fine detail and small scale printing possibilities with that type of machine. So I used various um, form lab printers available at the university, both in the CFPR and the fabrication department at Bauer to create all of these parts, which were then washed and cured. So here you can see a, a little bit of that kind of process. So once everything was printed um, in standard gray resin as the 
print. Oh, sorry, there's uh, a lot of traffic where I live. Um, so yeah, everything is printed in this gray resin as the printers in the university are generally used for prototyping, not final products. So now I had dozens of parts and components as well as arms and legs and props that all needed to be fabricated. So each SLA printed component was removed from its support, sanded, washed and painted in multiple layers. Um, and the FDM heads and bodies I, I applied uh, shoe polish to to bring out the texture and use uh, kind of uh, air drying putty for overhangs or obstruct obstructive gaps or flaws that weren't part of the design and also to add little bits of detail that wouldn't have survived the FDM printing process like lips and teeth. Mouths and hands also had additional detail added to give them a sense of depth. So that involved painting the hands white in multiple layers and then going back in and like with a very uh, watered down black ink, going back in and sort of picking out the details. But as much as possible, I tried to use the actual material uh, that the printers produced to make the objects and give extra depth. So then I began setting up for animation. Um, I had a small booth in the animation department with a rostrum set. A rostrum is a device that allows you to shoot from a, an aerial view and is used for line testing to the animation, as well as working on flat planes. So here you can see me lining up the animatic with the final shot and puppets. And here is a time lapse of me animating. As you can see, movements are built up through moving parts incrementally, but also often as with replacement animation through removing the puppet entirely in order to reposition and realign between each frame. Replacements are great as they allow you to essentially pre-visualize everything and allows for incredibly bouncy or morphing animation in physical space. It also allows for a far more collaborative process as the model maker and pre-visualized pre team, including the director, have a lot more control over what will eventually end up on screen. It is also slightly faster for this, but as an animator, there is this idea of a kind of natural flow in which you embody the puppet and are able to perform through it. You get into a kind of rhythm, which can lead to incredibly emotive performances. Replacement to an, replacements to a, like an increased level slightly diminishes this natural flow and take the animation into a more technical mechanical process. Um, which would be felt further if the animation wasn't involved in the design stage. This, of course, wasn't an issue with this project because obviously I was involved with every aspect of it. But in industry, um, when 3D printing is being used for an aesthetic purpose, it's generally used in this kind of replacement way in which um, the labor is sort of segmented out. So there needs to be this continuous feedback loop where everyone involved is having their say over what the performance will eventually be. So here you can see a few shots of me animating, manipulating the puppet and a smear frame. A, a smear frame is generally a classic 2D effect in which a smear of the character would appear for one, two or even three frames to create the illusion of fast movement and motion blur artificially, which obviously in stop motion and in 2D um, can't really be created uh, digitally. Like now it can, but in the past it used to be just hand drawn or you'd have to create these kind of these faked virtual smears to make it seem like motion was occurring. Uh, background elements and special effects were done with paper and composed or shot live in, sh in, in camera. There was also a little bit of actual 2D animation for the symbols that come out of her mouth as well. Slightly slower pace, you can actually see it. So once the film was complete, I sent it for feedback from various industry specialists, including my collaborators and those I pitched to at Lenonium in the Ukraine, um, as well as submitting it to festivals. 
as audience and critics are ultimately the judges as to whether an animated project is successful or not. So the film played at Encounters in Bristol earlier this year and subsequently has played at Manchester Animation Festival and Stop Trick Stop Motion Festival in Poland, as well as a few more. Um, it even received a critical review at Encounters. So through this case study, I believe I've pr proven that 3D printing can offer a novel aesthetic potential for stop motion that replaces animation allows for highly expressive animation, but reduces the ability to extend poses on set. That pushing the natural attributes in various printing, technology has its limits it, in so much as there were only so far I could push the layer heights before things began to go wrong, but it can create interesting, unique textures and visual styles if used creatively. 3D printing is an effective tool in combining visual style profiles and still has further application in the animation in an animation as well as broadening the creative fields to be used for its own material properties and textures, much like we already do with wood or glass or any other material. So now I'm just gonna sh show you the final film. Um, when this film goes online <laughs> eventually, that bit will be taken out just because um, it's still doing festivals. Uh, so yeah, an exclusive look. Okay. And now I'll take any questions if anyone has any questions. Wow, wow. fantastic, Laura Beth, that was great. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking at the chat to see if anybody's got any questions, but in the meantime, um, I absolutely love that. That's a very lovely kind of continuation of your um, research into animation against the backdrop of female rights. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that kind of um, poking fun at the medieval lose-lose situation. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a, a very good kind of social commentary. Um, how did you feel really, um, I, I had a couple of questions. One of them was about your, you mentioned quite quickly about remediation, remediated mm -hmm. nature of three-dimensional printing. Could you explain a little bit more about remediation, please? Uh, so remediation is a, an old media term or a media philosophy uh, that I think came out in like the nine, in like 1999. And it's this idea that uh, new technology is constantly advancing and taking over from another technology, uh, but remediation uh, sort of flipped that and said like that no technology really fully takes over from another one. It always remediates. It always takes it in on itself. And remediation has these two uh, concepts within it, which is immediation and hypermediation. And hypermediation is this idea that we are a that we're aware of the technology that's inside itself so it would be like with this like the idea is that you're meant to know that this is um 3d printed or like be able to sort of read upon that and a mediation is when that technology is no longer visible so that's like so that would be like interesting so like so vr is like meant to be immediate but we obviously are still acutely aware that we're wearing a big chunky headset uh-huh and in this case, you actually are making a parody of medieval woodcuts, but you're doing it completely the other way around. So you're building your printed block rather than removing away, which is the original yeah. technique. So you're making a nod back to the past. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So it's sort of doing both. So remediation should, I think, is meant to be able to like do both simultaneously. I may be misinterpreting that, but... Um, yeah, this is, it's difficult because obviously their concept is a very old, but also um, when they were sort of talking about it back in the 1990s, they were talking about things like photorealism and photorealistic paintings versus VR, but like, or um, CG, but CG back in like the 90s were like, isn't it amazing? You're like, no, it was terrible. <laughs> um, but of course, now we've got to a point where we're like broaching the uncanny. Um, and so this was kind of, an approach of trying to go back to a kind of hyper immediate state where where I think most of the time 3D printing is being used 
to try and get the sense of immediacy where we're not um, aware of. It's a weird thing. It's like they they simultaneously want us to be aware that it's stop motion, but also not. So I Disney do. was like really um, their whole thing was hyper reality. Like they were even though you know it's animation, they were striving to create a performance that was as as real as possible. And yeah. that's why we did things like rotoscoping, where you draw over live action. And so they were trying to create this really immediated experience for their audiences. And then the flip side of that is UPA, which were like, no, let's make use of, let's play with the medium of animation, make use of its natural um, potential as a medium. Um, so this is more on that side of things. It's It's got less to do with remediation as it does to do with the other things I mentioned, like glitch art and sloppy craft and this idea of like, not treating technical innovations as something to be perfected or highly sophisticated. It's, you know, in the same way that, you know, when we play with clay, the thing that we enjoy about that is that we can tell that it's got fingerprints in it. We can tell that it has been touched by hands. And so I'm kind of in, this project was kind of pointed at this idea of like, I wonder if you can use 3D printing as its own material, wonks and all, um, and sort of play with this idea that stop motion is sort of seen as this kind of tactile uh craft laning process which is becoming more and more polished and less and less the thing that you generally are meant to want to use it for so it's kind of a reflection on that that really um i'm really interested in your conversation about how animators would sometimes jump into the bodies of their characters mm. um if you were in the flow as it were and then you said that with replacement animation it was a little bit harder to do but more technical would you say the machine the 3d printer machine also had a kind of collaborative um kind of push in this uh, or influence in this um, kind of workflow? Would you say that there were little bits which made it harder or easier or that kind of affected how you made the uh, characters move? Yeah, so it's it's a tricky thing because, so the idea of like performance for it is something like uh, uh, Peter Lord of Ardman is very, like talks about quite a lot about, back in the day they didn't be, they weren't able to sort of see what they were doing. So they didn't have playback, you know, it was all on film. So whatever you were doing was what was going to happen. And if things fell down or things broke, then you had to start again. And there was no way of like re rectifying that. And so, but through that, you do have a kind of more natural organic movement that you're performing through more like a ballet or a theatre piece rather than like a, is that exactly where I want it to be? And, and so that's why you kind of got that kind of staccato movement sometimes, which isn't, which is sort of like perceived as being not as good, but actually is part of what makes stop motion, makes stop motion, stop motion and lively. Um, yeah. Um, and so I think replacement, per, replacement animation is also really old. It's, it was like, it's always been a part of the animation process. There was a guy called uh, George Powell, who was a Hungarian animator who really, um, I mean, he got like a, a technical award at the Oscars for it as well. But he basically developed this process to the like a massive extent where every part of the puppet was replaced. And he basically would hand draw and design every single iteration of the puppet and then get people to cut, carve them out of wood because this was in the 1930s. And then so he was able to create these really organic flowing puppets at a time when that was really insanely impressive but it was this very labor intensive process. And so what it did is it allowed lots of people to be animators when there was a real, there wasn't really that many animators and there certainly weren't that many stop motion animators. But a lot of them also talked about how they didn't really have any authorship over that performance because whatever they got is what they got and there wasn't so much they could really do on set. And replacement animation has sort of been used since then. So like the next really big use of it was on something, uh, was on Nightmare for Christmas the heads for both Sally and Jack were replacements and, and that was the next time it got used a lot. Um, also on James the Giant Peach because the same director. And then Leica, who is this big American studio that have really revolutionized the use of 3D printing within animation. They also won an Oscar for their kind of technical achievement in that process. Sort of brought that 
further and so now they've got to the point with their most recent film where they're basically printing out every single frame of animation which is a choice and that's kind of the point of my whole thesis is that that obviously from a kind of journalistic point of view or a critical point of view there's a there are a lot of voices that are saying like what's the point at that point you're just making it cg and just printing it out or whatever but my kind of interpretation of it is everything in animation is a choice there are rules that you follow but the rules that you follow you largely invent yourself so it kind of depends on what you want to do and so what they focus on is they're kind of like the um the disney of stop motion they're sort of focusing i i believe they're focusing on this kind of hyper realism completely immediated completely immersive uh version of stop motion which is sort of stripping back that kind of staccato movement where you have any kind of notion that this isn't perfect but if you it's one of those difficult things that if you are an animator you can see that it isn't but for the general audiences arguably now they're not quite sure and a lot of people do think it's cg and then there's this kind of weird period of time where you have to be like oh what's really the point of this then um but at the end of the day it's also it's all still entertainment so really you could argue what's the point of any of it so it's a kind of <laughs> it's a difficult balance thing um and also animation is a hard field to study because it's it's too it's a a, a, a medium of extremes of like these huge Hollywood blockbusting films that have millions and millions of pounds and make million and millions of pounds and then the alternative version which is like this film where it's like one person making a film on their own in a cupboard so it's like it's a very hard thing to sort of or a very broad thing to then span the entire industry because there's a lot of reasons or rationale as to why one thing might be better or worse in any given situation. That was a very yeah. long answer. No, I love it. Can you speak a little bit to the humour that's possible in animation? Because it seems like there is quite a lot of irony and in in-jokes. I mean, visually as well as in the narrative sense. Um, yeah, I think I think by nature, because you can, like, compared to live action, like people like Wes Anderson are a good interpretation of that in in live action which is probably why he's also drawn to stop motion is that you can really plant a lot of very specific visual gags and and jokes that maybe no one will notice put like which is generally referred to as are uh, um as easter eggs which you only get if you've maybe watched it or you freeze frame things and I think you know, I think if people really enjoy animation or in, in the process of it and really enjoy it, there's a lot of time spent on doing things that you maybe don't see um, possibly ever that are probably hidden behind trees and stuff. But there's a, I guess that's where it kind of falls back on to being a craft and this kind of pride in what you're doing. And I think comedy is, I guess, the... Um, kind of generic <laughs> mode in which animation works within most of the time because it's often perceived as being for children and thus it's often sort of seen as being entertainment and just and, and often comedic as well yeah. um and then in academia sometimes that's sort of frowned upon because there's been an awful lot of work over the years to try and perceive get animation perceived as both an art form and something that has more depth to it than just that but I think once again it kind of comes down to personal personal taste, personal choice, and what works for whatever aspect you're trying to get across in the film. That is brilliant. We've got a couple of comments here. Basically, we love your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's clear and informative. That's what Sarah Bodman says. And does anyone else want to pitch in some questions? I'm afraid we're having a bit of a problem in the main room in the W block. The camera has sort of given up its ghost some or the other, so I can't take any physical questions from anyone uh, unless I was a run outside from this photo studio back to the main room. So, but <laughs> I can't <laughs> anyone else at the moment. So I'm sorry about all that. I'm sure there was lots of questions, and uh, maybe I'll just walk over there if you're happy to just carry on the conversation for a moment and uh, I, I get some more questions. I love the way it looks edible. I think <laughs> <you're>, <laughs> the kind of way that everything has been made has this kind of like 
sense that it's been piped out of icing and that you could eat everything afterwards. It's a real kind of um, that that scale that you've chosen. It's handleable and it's kind of looks tasty. The colours that you've chosen, <laughs> you polish them. It looks it looks a little bit like biscuits. I think is what. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, in terms of, you were talking a little bit about the kind of incredibly labor intensive options of making every frame or um, taking some live action and translating it. And then you've gone down the line of this kind of um, naive abbreviation and, and very, very spare lines. And I wonder, will you ever use these characters again? Because now you have them and they, they, you've kind of spent hours um, you know, carefully making them and painting them and building them in 3D space, do you feel like you can revive them and use them for another project? I think that's sadly one of the kind of misinterpretations of replacement animation is that you, I mean, you probably could reuse some of them, but unfortunately I think because of the the kind of bespoke nature of the process, you kind of have to start again. Um, you can you know, I probably would be able to, re most likely I'd be able to reuse them for shots and for stills and there will be certain aspects of it. But you'd, if I was to develop this, say, into like a series where we did the exact same thing, but like a different narrative, you'd have to be careful to like reuse things because if you, there's a, a very common uh, thing in animation of recycling sequences. And like, there's a very classic example in Disney, if you watch Snow White and then you watch, um, I think it's Sleeping Beauty, it's the exact same turnaround. Um, that's been rotoscoped but just with a different dress and hair colour. Uh, so it's not an uncommon thing, but I think with something so short, there would be a an issue with people being like, didn't they use that exact same sequence last time? So um, yeah, I think that 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 I think is the is the strength of 3D printing is that it does offer those bespoke natures. And also if you were going to do this traditionally, you'd either have to hand carve everything. Or you'd have to hand, you'd have to, and also in the material you wanted, if you wanted it in something uh, sustainable or something that was going to be able to be painted multiple times, you probably would have to make a mold for every single one of those replacements as well. So in that sense, it does speed or make it easier as well. I can imagine you setting up a big line on them, people who want to take a frame away, like yeah. they have a physical <laughs> object. I think Suzanne's got a question. Yeah, I have a question. You touched already a little bit on it, but where is the commercial niche for this kind of, you know, it's in between. So as you said, you could say it could be completely digital, then you have the handcrafted stop animation at the other end. So where, what, who is then, where's the commercial niche? niche? Who is the audience? And again, you said, you, it could be mistaken as completely uh, computer generated. So, so where do you put it then? As in, like three D printing and animation as a whole? Um, no, I mean a stop animation with three D printing because you know it's a very much a hybrid. Yes. And, and another, perhaps, the follow on question is now it's presented at all these festivals. How is it judged? So. What is it a proper stop animation? Is it a hybrid? Is it, you know, is it seen as digital because 3D printing is a digital method? So, so yeah, where is the new niche? <laughs> okay, so I think um, in terms of industrial like recognition or like uh, the place for it um, economically is it's very widely used already. Um, a lot of my research is sort of folk that has been about talking to various people, uh, both directors and, and studios as a whole, as well as fabrication, um, like stop motion fabricators specifically, um, and fabrication and animators who use this, both from like kind of the authorship and the artistic side of it, but also from the kind of economics side of things. And it just, it, the general consensus is it's useful when it's useful. As, as all tools are, or as all fabrication tools are. Stop motion often gets sort of pigeonholed as this very um, archaic Luddite kind of analog way of making, but it's incredibly digital, always has been and has, and has been certainly for a very long time. There isn't really any animation production in a kind of big scope way that doesn't use various fabric, digital fabrication tools, whether that be laser printing, 3D printing, 
uh, CNCing in a big, big way. Um, so in that sense, it's just part of the toolkit for most people now. Either they use bureaus and they order in specific materials, or uh, if they're able to, places like Leica, for example, because they've been there since the, the dawn of the uh, and invented that kind of process with people, they have a lot of connections where they've been able to work with fabrication, uh, work with 3D printing industries or industry machines um, and software engineers to actually get exactly what they want from it. And they've done a lot of work uh, specifically in color printing and sort of honing that and making color profiles with um, SLS printing specifically. Um, so there's that kind of, and the film industry is an odd one in terms of commercial recognition a lot of what uh Leica does in terms of this kind of hybrid thing is they use their uh the stop motion side of it in a lot of their advertising so they were very well known where most of the time stop motion prior to them was quite secretive about their behind the scenes processes and it might be included on a dvd but they generally didn't tell you like the nuts and bolts of everything like it completely blew the doors on that and we're like no look here's this is how we made everything this is made out of popcorn this is made out of 3d printing and this is exactly the process we do and they do a lot of lectures and a lot of talks about the process and they're not very secretive about it because they use that as a way of getting people um, interested in the film and there is this just constant interest in the way things are done like there's this quite weird since it or weird thing that like if a if an animation is done in stop motion so if you think of like the john, john lewis ads at christmas for example are often stop motion animated weirdly the making of video online will always get more views than the actual film itself uh because people just really like knowing how things are made and then from a kind of film festival point of view the marker of, I guess, excellence or like it being accepted is it getting selected for festivals because festivals obviously don't let in everything. Uh, they do have pre-selection and they do have panels. If it wins things, it's been sort of seen to be either an audience award or it's been given by a jury who feel like it's doing something innovative or the story is particularly strong. But in terms of its hybrid nature, generally it's considered stop motion because the animation process itself is stop motion. The hybridity doesn't really come into it, I think, for most people in stop motion, because although it's been modelled and pre-visualised, it still creates, it still reads predominantly as a stop motion film. And it's also being marketed as a stop motion film. There's a thing within uh, film in general, if the people who made it say it's a documentary, then we accept it as a documentary. People might uh, criticise it or might suggest that it's not. But generally, if you say a film is stop motion, most people do tend to believe you that it is, uh, because I guess the perception is that you wouldn't lie. Um, but I do think where it borders is when it's starting to not be able to be read. And I think that's where a lot of the criticism around um, these people that are using it to the extent that they are, are perhaps on this kind of borderline between like, are they taking it too far or are they not taking it far enough or... Are they not using the medium appropriately? I don't really think of it in that way. I think, it, you know, they're all individual artists and they have the right to use it in any other way they want. And another thing that's become quite, uh, is starting to happen now is that uh, there are fully uh, CG composited faces. Uh, so the last year's BBC uh, Christmas special was done by a, a director called Elliot Deer. And he basically, it's all stop motion, all animated, but then the faces seemed, I think, to most people, because we've kind of become used to it, that they would probably be replacement. But actually, they're not. They're fully CG composited faces onto stop motion puppets. So that's taking that hybridation even further. And there's a kind of argument to be made that if if the if we're able to do that now and it's very convincing and if the the aim for being able to do 3d printed faces for every single frame is uh, is realism and nuance and getting this perfect uh performance then would maybe compositing not be the easier cheaper better way of doing that because you can continuously uh tweak it but there is also the flip side of it is that 3d printed objects like any objects any material do have their own aura they do have their own textural visual thing and the main reason why stop motion tends to get used commercially 
still to this day is that there's something ethereal, something tangible about how the objects react to light on set that even with, and it is getting really difficult now and it is getting really nuanced, even with the most sophisticated CG film, it's still not quite, the human eye is really good at detecting little tiny differences and there's something about things being real wool and real um, materials on set that still get people going, I guess. Um, but yes, I agree, it's it's a really my new shy thing <laughs> and for and the other issue is obviously for audiences generally i don't think i still don't think they really care as long as the film the story is good um one person i did interview sort of discussed it because he he does both cg 2d and stop motion um animation and he mentioned that he referred to it as like having a different flavored sandwich every day like you get bored you'd get bored of it if you had cheese every single day so having a stop motion film and then watching a CG film and having a 2D film, it's not that anyone is better or worse or more commercially viable or more financially better than anyone, because that's another aspect that I'll come back to. But it's all about just giving the audience different things and different visual stimuli to engage with the story. And sometimes it can be reflective of that. And sometimes it's just a way in which that filmmaker chose to make that film. And I think in stop motion, there's this very odd common assertion that like it must be more expensive because it's real space and real environment but each animation process is basically the financial strain of it is it's just weighted differently so where cg is um generally perceived as being cheaper or quicker because it's all virtual and doesn't exist the amount of nitpicking you can do makes the whole process longer and rendering takes a really long time and costs a lot of money to rent or have render farms and the electricity stop motion is generally front heavy because you have to make everything but once you get animating it's very quick and then the editing really quick because everything's in camera ideally and then 2d is just continuously hard all the way through because you're you're doing every frame i'm i'm interested in the um the glitches you were talking about already mm -hmm. in terms of your uh the 3d printed uh, materials you have made you had a lot of post process post processing to be done there as well didn't you did you yes. include I mean that's where your where sort of the craft element comes in so did you did you sort of look at certain things and say well maybe I'll just leave a little bit of shoe polish off there to get an effect and stuff so how does how does that come into your into the 3d manufacturing then or the, the 3d printing or the the final out I think because the main thing that sort of came up in mind was the use of this of the layer lines as a kind of texture profile because generally the 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 want or the desire is to make things in 3d printing generally is as smooth as possible unless you're going for strength uh which is more of a kind of engineering concern but most people are looking for like the best possible surface finish so that this was basically a a flip of that like what if you're using that surface finish that's sort of inherently seen as a flaw as as an advantage as a as a stylistic choice um but there there's kind of a I did sort of toy with the things like, should I be filling in fake things? And basically it, it comes back to this idea of making rules for the world that you're creating. It's like, is it going to create an interesting visual or is it going to be disruptive? Are people going to be wondering what that means in that individual frame? So if there was like overhangs where things were like noodling or coming undone, then I would fill it in and then use the shoe polish just to hide it amongst the rest of it. So it would be tonally the same so that you don't get because the problem with obviously working in three dimensions is that you have shadow is shadow and light is also your enemy <laughs> so you don't want to create all these kind of loot things that are sort of creating like visual artifacts on the screen that people are like was that something i was meant to be paying attention to or does that matter so it's just sort of playing with what what elements of it are beneficial or um negative because glitch art in general comes more from a a musical background it's more to do with uh, sound, but there obviously have been a lot of people that have used glitch uh, visually. And so it's the idea of like creating a bit like what Susanna was asking, creating these kind of hybrid universes. So one of the case studies I was going to do that, unfortunately, um, time restraint wise, and uh, the person I was going to collaborate with 
basically won a pitch for something else and we didn't do it was going to be a film that played on that a lot more and had more of a kind of narrative structure that sort of played with this idea of uh, a, a free puppet a cg puppet becoming real and and uh, emotionally handling that and also i i wanted to do things that were about like playing with the 3D printer's ability to sort of make flaws. There's like a, a community online that basically documents every f weird flaw a 3D printer does, where it just sort of randomly spews for no reason because it hasn't caught quite caught the line or it starts to like step or it elephant foots in a weird way. Um, but trying to also make, it's, it's a difficult kind of, e I guess, ethical thing of like, on organic glitch but if you're then going to have it in animation it does have to have a certain level of continuity otherwise it will just look like a chaos or mess on screen and it won't read in the same way so there's this kind of um sweet like i said in the presentation there's a sweet spot between like using it to its fullest but not taking it so far that it starts doing something you don't want it to and also it's very hard to organically make a glitch happen so, so you have to carry it on for every part of the uh, stop uh, motion animation as well, stop frame animation as well. So you, you cut, you know, one glitch is maybe fine for one for one uh, frame, but then you'd have to carry it on with the next frames as well. So it's almost like planning your glitches as well, isn't it? And that's, yeah. that's, that's something that comes with experience, maybe? Experience or and also I think there's, there's work to be done with uh, direct drivers and working directly with code and the machine, which I would, I would have had to have like gone more down that route mm -hmm. um, and had someone <laughs> that I could have worked with that understood the coding side of things a little bit more. But the way I sort of did it was by just making, just playing with the, um, the slicer software, which I think there's also parameters because obviously if you can, if you can re deconstruct the CAD program and make it do things that it's not really, it, it will keep being angry at you and telling you you've done it wrong and that this won't print well. But there's ways you can play with the, both between the CAD model or the 3D model and the slicer that you can also make that happen. So if you put something erroneous in, in space, obviously it won't know how to deal with that. But if you can heat up the filament enough and string it across, it would still connect. So there's definitely a way of playing with it, but I feel like in animation and film, unless you're going to do something very abstract, which is also possible, there, there needs to be a reason for it so that narratively it makes sense as well. But you could definitely have like, if you had a character and then you just really ranked up all of the different components to try and almost randomly to see what would happen. You could have like the same model printed six or seven different times where everything is just wrong. And then that could create uh, a symbolic imagery of like chaos in the character or something going wrong emotionally in the character. And it's, there's quite a nice, there's quite a lot of films that play with that idea, just not in, generally in stop motion. It generally tends to be in either uh, CG or 2D because uh, you can contain it. <laughs> We should, we should have another presentation then on the on the prepared the scripted glitch in, in animation <laughs> or something like that so it's absolutely fascinating thank you very much for our best to for for joining us and uh, sophie boone's just um <laughs> comment you've probably seen as well so i could listen thank to you you. thank you very much for sharing your research for sharing your film um uh, thank you for we're, we're sort of running out of time now so I just want to wrap it up by again say thank you, thank you for everyone for attending. Sorry about the technical glitch we had here in W Block, but the recording of the of your talk will be on the website uh, minus the film. So because that's as you know, best that that's going still uh, around the festivals, but we'll sh we'll show that here at some point as well once it's back. Um, so yes, yeah, thank you again. Thank you for everyone for coming. As I said, the recording will be available on the CFBR info at ue.ac.uk um, website soon. Have a very happy, thank you, Von Jin, for, um, for your question, for leading the questions and answer session. Thank you for everyone for coming. Our next um, seminar is on the 12th of uh, January. Until then, wish everyone a very happy uh, Christmas and happy new year. And uh, yeah, all the best from us uh, at the uh, W Block in French. So we're going to stop the presentation now. Feel free to sit around the tables and chat to Laura Bess or anyone who is still around the tables. But um, from me and from Zana and from everyone here at W Block, <laughs> take Merry care. Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Bye. 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 Right, I'm going to run and switch off the.
Well, lots of congratulations from Fabio and um, Neve, Sophie and Lisa Sheppy and Sarah Bobman. But it's fantastic. And me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.